Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Welcome to Left of Block. My name is Mark Anthony Neal, host, our 14th season. And we're thrilled to be joined by Professor Jasmine Nicole Cobb, who is Professor of African and African American Studies and Art History and Visual Studies here at Duke University. She's the author of Picture Freedom, Remaking Black Visuality in the Early 19th Century, published by our friends at NYU Press, 2015 editor of the African American Literature in Transition, Volume 2, published by Cambridge University in 2021. And she's joining us here today to talk about New Growth, The Art and Texture of Black Hair, published by Duke University Press, late, late 2022. Of Thank you. New Growth, Sarah Haley writes, in this brilliantly conceived and groundbreaking book, Jasmine Cole Cobb provides startling new insights about the entanglements of black hair with the archive, the political and the visual. New growth will surprise and linger with readers and it will make a highly influential contribution to gender studies, cultural studies, visual studies, and black studies for years to come. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me. High praise from I Sarah Haley. I appreciate it, yes, I appreciate it. So I have to ask this question. I've known you long enough. Mm -hmm. We, even as academics, right, who are supposed to be dispassionate about subjects, mm -hmm. <laughs> objective about subjects, mm -hmm. when all is said and done, we actually always somehow find ourselves writing about ourselves. Completely. Mm -hmm. So what is your hair story? My hair story. So I tell people about new growth that when I started thinking about writing about hair, I thought that I had a hair issue or a hair story. And the deeper I got into the project, I learned we all have a hair <laughs> issue and a hair story um, that defies gender distinctions, times in life, places, so on and so forth. So I started thinking about hair when I was in Philadelphia and researching Picture Freedom. And Philadelphia is a city it's a, it's a great city for hair. Braid shops everywhere, there's locks, there's a natural community, but then there's also hair shows, hair pageants, competitions and the like. And in the process of just sort of living my life and moving about the city, there was this moment where hair was kind of blowing up online, the emergence of a natural hair movement in blogs and vlogs. There was also early um, marketing materials to get black women to participate in studies about the link between straightening and fibroids. So I was sort of inundated with images about hair as relevant to so many things while also deciding to no longer chemically straighten my own hair. So I cut all my hair off and I kept attending stuff and Many years later, I arrived at the project that is New Growth. But it was all of that. It was figuring out who am I, how am I to be as an academic, because I was in grad school, and is there a link between straightening and fibroids? And if I leave the world of hair competitions and straightening, it, does that mean I'm plunging into a world of this natural hair movement? Lots of questions both sort of intellectual and personal led me here. We talk a great deal, even now, about black respectability politics in mm -hmm. black America, right? And, mm -hmm. and it can always be reduced to how do Negroes look when they go out into the world? Yes, <laughs> right. quite simply, yes. What mm -hmm. shoes you wear, you don't mm -hmm. go out wearing slippers. Yes. Y you know, you mm -hmm. don't wear house clothes. Uh -oh. uh, preferably, <laughs> even if a bonnet costs two hundred fifty dollars, yeah. <laughs> you preferably you, you should be wearing wear your bonnet, a bonnet outside. Mm -hmm. And hair has always been a critical part of that, and at yeah. least throughout much of the twentieth century, mm -hmm. right, really into the nineteen sixties. Yeah, the idea of the press and curl, mm -hmm. right, was the best way for black women to present themselves. Yes, 
in public. It's true. Mm -hmm. Talk about the shift that we've seen, whether it's natural hair or other forms of processed hair. I always mm -hmm. remember reading Kobina Mercer, Welcome mm -hmm. to the Jungle, back in the day. Mm -hmm. And he dived into these debates about yeah. processed hair. Yeah. And he, he makes this argument that once you pass a comb through your hair, by definition, you have processed it's hair. It's true. <laughs> it's true that there is something about appearing kempt, right, that we require <laughs> of black hair in public. And I think the process, whether it's pressing comb or um, later chemical straighteners to, I would even add blowouts done in Dominican hair salons. Uh -huh. There's uh -huh. all of these ways of signaling that time has been spent on the management of hair. I think what I find interesting about that across styles is that, um, you know, that's holding that value over time from the 60s into the 21st century. Um, across place I found and have a photograph of a Dominican hair salon in Amsterdam. So this idea that across the diaspora there's some sort of um, requirement that people of African descent spend time on indicating right. that they've done their hair. Um, but it's interesting, I can remember very vividly this sort of shift around sh um, chemical straighteners where I would hear, you know, Straightening hair, whether it be press and comb or chemical straighteners, would allow um, women in particular to go to the gym and participate in life in a way that they couldn't <laughs> if they didn't straighten their hair. To then arriving to this moment where they could not participate in life because they had straightened their hair, right? That now all the money and time invested in straightening made it hard to go to the gym or get caught in the rain because it messed up, you know, the investment, so to speak. So I think the, the practices endure, but interestingly, interestingly, the meaning and sense of freedom we feel through the practices seems to shift over time. Frederick Douglass, right, and I don't think anyone, like if you had to pick a starting five yeah. mm -hmm. of black historical icons, yeah. mm -hmm. right, Fred, <laughs> Frederick yeah. Douglass is on the team, mm -hmm. right? But he's also emerged as a style icon. It's true. It's true. For black folks. Mm -hmm. and, and, and part of it is the clothes. Yes. The sartorial choices. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But a large part of it is it's the hair. The hair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk about Frederick Douglass in the context of this project. Yeah, so Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass is a figure for me, you know, I'm always first looking for what have black women been up to in time. And so I, I wouldn't have elected to begin with Frederick Douglass, and yet his presence is undeniable, <laughs> remains significant <laughs> for centuries. And so I couldn't not attend to Frederick Douglass. Um, in my first encounters with sort of um, memes and material online about natural hair. I saw Frederick Douglass in hair forms in the 21st century <laughs> as a way to talk about things like shrinkage and kinky hair texture and so on and so forth. And so I just sort of went back and tried to understand what did his hair mean to him. Mm -hmm. And what I was surprised to find was that it meant a great deal to him and that he was quite decisive about the length of his hair, the style of his hair. Um, he talks about his hair and his life writing, and it's a great way to understand the meaning and events surrounding black hair under slavery, because it comes up in how people talk about their experience of bondage. Uh, Frederick Douglass also uh, is inspiration to contemporary artists. So I opened the book with Rasheed Johnson's work um, about his hair parted like Frederick Douglass. And it's just, I think the hair, his hair itself is just visually stunning. And then when we uh, associate that significance with all that happens in his life and that he maintains this long hair through his life, through all his photographs, it sort of gave me a roadmap for thinking about black hair in and after slavery. You mentioned Rasheed Johnson, right? Mm -hmm. and there's something amazing about 
versus Rasheed Johnson, I, I think I, it was always clear to me in Manning Marable's mm -hmm. later years yeah. that he mm -hmm. was gesturing sure. mm -hmm. <laughs> to, yeah. to Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. I think about, it, and someone described this as Jay-Z's Basquiat cosplay. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Which, which, which <laughs> made me chuckle. But it's clearly very sure. deliberate. Mm -hmm. You know, do you find it fascinating that everyday folks to a certain extent, mm -hmm. you know, in the case of Jay-Z and Rashid, they're both artists, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Still holding on to the power, whatever power they see in, in these hairstyles from centuries ago, you know, at least in the case of Yeah, Douglas. I, I think so. And that, I think that's a, a, a great connection, Jay-Z and Basquiat, because there's this way in which I view Jay-Z's hair now as, among other things, a flex, right? Yeah, that right. he can grow yeah. this hair <laughs> and wear it this way, you know, as a person of his wealth at this point in his own life, right. age-wise. Um, all of that. But I do find it fascinating that um, for black men, there is this sort of um, citational legacy that we see and yeah. hair gets to be a part yeah. of it, whether right. it's right. Johnson and Douglas, whether it's Jay-Z and Basquiat. I would probably um, place Cornell West in this sort of mm -hmm. Manny mm -hmm. Marable, Frederick Douglass kind of timeline. Um, and it's, it's interesting for thinking about black men too, because it gives us another valence beyond thinking about black men in the barber shop, right? That there's this other kind of community around not cutting one's hair and mm. connecting to the past and um, a sort of display of politics um, as the individual understands it. I can remember being an undergraduate, right? In college and I was coming into some sort of political consciousness at the moment largely through the nation of Islam, mm -hmm. right? And that's when, you know, I got my first Philly cut, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because all the NOI yeah. guys had yeah. the close crop mm -hmm. fade, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and, and it yep. said something for me, how I felt politically at the time, yes. you know, to be able to wear my hair that way. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's the culture, right, yeah. that we move in. And I think the politics, although they can sort of be truncated in popular culture as it's, promulgated through media, the politics is still so much a part of the popular culture as we live it. The opening line of the book, which might be one of the best opening lines of an academic book ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Everybody else, this is a study of, it is yeah. my hope. <laughs> yeah. A tentative freedom of Afro-textured hair. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in the next page, you talk about this book is a question of liberation. Yeah. Unpack that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think across my work, I'm always interested in questions of freedom, how black people live their freedom um, in extrajudicial ways, right? That how we can talk about black people and freedom outside of um, notions of citizenship and legal recognitions. And hair, over time, is constantly a part of that. So in slavery, it comes up. Um, the philosopher Paul Taylor cites this example of um, people of African descent emerging from a slave ship having cut patterns into their hair. And the slavers didn't understand how they did this without access to tools, right? Um, there's the people I talk about in the book, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Jacobs, even Harriet Tubman, who in their recounting their experience of slavery, tell us, and this happened to my hair, right? You know, my hair stopped me from bleeding after fighting a slave breaker. Um, my hair was cut off as part of an attempted sexual assault. Or my hair saved my life by, you know, guarding my head from a nearly lethal blow. So there's all this ways in, you know, sort of a practical sense hair shows up. Um, and then there's, of course, the history that many of us have some understanding of is the 1960s, right? Mm -hmm. And Angela Davis and the Afro. I'm talking about all of the sisters and brothers who are victims of the system, who are easy targets of the police. Black Panthers and the importance of embracing natural hair and thinking about blackness as beautiful. Uh, and all the way up to the contemporary moment, which I close the book with, with some complicated 
questions about, but this way in which you know the Crown Act mm -hmm. and thinking about hair in the workplace. When we first introduced the bill, we focused on the workplace, and then we realized, <coughs> quite frankly, that um, if it, we only focus on the workplace, that teachers would be covered, but the students in the schools would not. But this law is long overdue. Uh, I, like millions and millions of Americans, uh, was brought to a consciousness around this issue. What it means um, to not have to alter oneself to get a job, right? I think there's the, the legal framework and political rhetoric that scaffolds that kind of work. But then there's just the pr practical reality, even for our coworkers here at Duke, to know that you don't have to alter yourself to keep your job. Right. You know. But you know, but you also still have to address in the context of that the feelings that you have. It's you know, yes. the boys is double consciousness. How yes. are people perceiving? How are they perceiving? Because of it? this hair, yes. even if they legally can't get rid of me from this job. Yes, <laughs> and how are you going to navigate the terrain? Or the question that I, you know, was sort of a, a inspiration in thinking about how to frame new growth is the can I touch your hair? <laughs> um, to which as a PSA, I like to say, don't ask folks if you, <laughs> if you can touch their hair if you don't know them. But um, I see that as part of this question of freedom, right? The freedom to say no, right. Um, right. the freedom to display oneself and, you know, only offer the visual as a way of sense making. So, yeah. You offer four terms to give us some inroad into mm -hmm. thinking about black hair. First one is archive. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about black hair in the archive. Yeah, black hair in the archive. There was this thing that sort of came up, <clears throat> whether I was thinking about documentary film or folks like Tubman and Jacobs, where um, hair holds our stories and holds our feelings, yeah. you know, um, whether it's the stories of slavery that people talk about. Um, something interesting I found about Frederick Douglass is uh, a practice of give, gifting locks of hair to family members as a way of sort of archiving the body to say I was here, you know, um, and that was a practice that I was familiar with in my own family, but I had never thought about how much cultural practice existed right. around right. that. And I think relatedly, you know, because people take seriously that their hair holds stories, holds memories, holds feelings, um, people are cautious about what happens to their hair, right? Yeah. So David Hammonds, the artist, talks about having a hard time procuring hair because people thought he was going to do voodoo and ritual <laughs> with other people's hair. <laughs> um, Alison Saar riffs on these kinds of things and various pieces of hers that, you know, uh, folklore and mythologies about not letting your hair get into the wrong hands. And so yeah. I think people very much feel personal about hair, there's, um, I guess we could call it a myth or a notion that, um, you know, when some women cut all their hair off, you know, this question of sanity, stability, are they going through something, are they shedding something? Um, so we, we all sort of function as if hair right. is a keeper of a moment in time. You know, and what do, how, how do we feel about that? And where do we want it to be left? Or how do we want to let go of it? The second term you use is texture. Um, and and I, I have this moment watching Eddie Murphy in Boomerang. Mm -hmm. And it's like... Yeah, it's a process. It, mm -hmm. Eddie looking a little yeah. different now, yeah. right? It's yeah. like, you know, he's been a Hollywood star mm -hmm. all this time, but mm -hmm. now he wants to be like this Clark Gable yes. leading uh -huh. man type. Mm -hmm. I'm the Alec Ganza Mac Daddy of the Month. Oh, I see. Well, let me, let me get a good look. Check it. And it's like, so it's not a jerry curl, it's right? Like maybe and I, an S and, curl. And, and, and mm -hmm. I remember it was, well, he had his hair texturized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I went to Astor Place in New York. I was in college, right? Mm -hmm. Grad school, came down to New York. Where can I go to get my hair texturized? And, mm -hmm. I, and I did that for like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this mm -hmm. is crazy. But texture speaks to so many things, right? Because the, sometimes the difference between 
acceptability of black hair, yes. right? mm -hmm. even among black folks, mm -hmm. comes down to the texture of your hair. So, so talk about sure. texture in the context of this book. Yeah, texture was one of those things that I couldn't not deal with, and I think it, you know, it stumped me for a while um, because I sort of open refusing to deal with good hair or bad, bad hair, hair yep. right, which is a thing. And fortunately, I don't hear that language now as much as I did right. as a kid, but it's a thing, this idea that there are better textures to have. <laughs> Um, than, than and, other and textures. And folks are making marrying choices. Yes, based on, on that. Right? Mm -hmm. They sure are. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a thing that I think haunts folks um, for various reasons. I think for me in the book, texture, dealing with texture and sort of, you know, the, how hair feels in the hand and how hair looks like it's going to feel because that eddie murphy <laughs> hair looks smooth it's, <laughs> it's very right. shiny yeah, and but boomerang. it didn't look greasy no it didn't look <laughs> greasy which there's a joke about in another movie right. of his right and coming to america <laughs> so it's not greasy in that kind of a way um but for me i think in the book and what i want to get work out is this way in which texture hair texture is racializing, yeah. right? right. Um, much in the way that we believe the color of skin is racializing. So when we see certain textures of hair, we then come to conclusions about people's racial identity. Right. When right. we don't see a certain texture, um, we come to conclusions about folks' racial identity. And so texture, aside from judgments of quality, I wanted to sort of sit with what does it mean to theorize about folks yeah. based on hair texture as distinct from skin color. And that's really something that the artists who are dealing with hair bring sure. out very prominently this conversation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Sonia Clark, the craft artist, I think invites us to think about that with um, using silk thread and yarn mm -hmm. to mimic the quality of hair. Lots and lots of hair references. Um, in fact, a friend of mine cut her hair and I actually used her hair to make a piece in the last show. It's not just her hair, it's her. And then I like to think of it even beyond that, that if it's her DNA, then it's all the people who came before her. Alison Saar, who uses things like broomsticks mm -hmm. and bristles, um, wire, to sort of tell us about hair. So I think the artist really help, helped me understand um, the visual questions about hair in this whole other way. So this piece I'm roughing out, she's going to be wearing a girdle made of skillets. These skillets become a protection, but they also point towards women in their sort of activities within the kitchen. The materials they use invite us to think about yeah, how is it that we believe something is going to be hard, right, mm -hmm. from looking at it and then decide to ask a stranger if we can touch their hair? Or why are we shocked that black hair is actually very soft and not very hard, right? Yeah. As a sidebar, I mean, you teach in an art history department. Who were the artists who drew you into this project? That's a great question. I would definitely say that um, Lorna Simpson was one of the first artists that I was looking at her work and trying to understand why do I see a hair story in this project? And she is, she is not telling me this is a hair story, but it is what I see. And some of that I think is Lorna is confounding and a yeah. conceptual artist. So right. she's sort of means to do that. Right. My reaction is sort of what, what is ginned up by her assembling pictures and words together. Like this piece here, it's on a, I could put a silk screen on a felt uh, piece. Mm -hmm. And um, it too is a before and after shot about, uh, as a kind of beauty ad. And in her work, what I really saw uh, was this way in which we look at hair and we 
make judgments about interiority, right? This is the 60s that if you are pro-black, then you are not putting chemical right. straighteners on your right. hair, right? Your interior is judged by your exterior. And she, for me, in dealing with her work, reminded me to just sit with the exterior, to not sort of make a judgment about the interior, but to try to think about what is on the surface and how it is and all of that. Um, I think the next probably most influential group of artists for me uh, in doing the work was really um, independent documentary filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Those were the works that I think I was consuming sort of passively or benignly in my own hair journey. Um, largely black women filmmakers working in the 90s, turning a camera on and working through how they feel about their hair, what happened to them as children, how they connect mm -hmm. to other women or don't because of their hair. And I think that is such a rich archive of work because it tells us a lot about a particular moment in time um, when, if you think of 90s film and television and women in particular in popular media, you know, the emergence of actors on, um, primetime television mm -hmm. and network TV and what kind of hairstyles we get from that moment. Going into the early 2000s, artists, I think of um, hip hop and R&B artists, mm -hmm. bad boy. There's a slick and a sheen that is very different from the texture and quality we see in these independent films mm -hmm. from people working at the same time. Yeah. 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 The other word that you use is touch. Touch, touch is the thing that um, I think in the end, because I, I approached this as only visual at first, and yeah. I found that that, that wasn't going to cut it. Um, touch is the thing that I think, in an interesting way, is sort of at the root of, no pun intended, the complicated feelings people have about their hair stories, right? So when I take the book around and even working through my own stuff, um, the way people were touched in the grooming of their hair, right, um, comes up a lot. Um, the way in which natural hair and the quote unquote natural hair movement, I think invited us into new forms of touch, Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, how we handle hair, if we, discard notions of bad hair, inviting gentleness and tenderness um, into touch was a thing. And then, you know, how artists, I think, really make touch front and center in the treatment of hair in their yeah. artworks, you know, whether it's um, Ellen Gallagher showing us a surface we want to touch and making her touch apparent through the application of putty to paper. Her works often brings together different medias. She uses pages that are all dating from the 1930s to the 1970s. These are all magazines that are aimed at an African-American audience. Or Sonia Clark, again, that we can't remove the idea of the human hand as shaping the image we see in black hair um, and how we have to work through touch as much as image. You know, I think as a way of getting around this focus of on respectability and black yeah. bodies in public. You mentioned surface. That's the other word that you use to frame the book. Yeah, I think that the surface, as we see in uh, each of those artists' works, you know, is again about thinking about this racializing work that we understand hair is doing. Mm. Um, I think to take surface seriously is to think about that as um, a fabrication, if you will, that folks make choices about what they do or don't do with their hair, that it's not um, a biological imposition, right? That you are not just sort of stuck with a hair texture and <laughs> you know that it is this, um, wild kind of thing that, you know, again, as Kobina Mercer tells us, even natural is a construction, construction. right? Yeah. That um, right. natural is made, whether it's adding hair to create locks or running a comb through hair, right. 
you know, um, shea or butter. yeah, shea, <laughs> shea, butter. <laughs> shea butter, coconut oil, all these things are ways of handling the thing and, and making a surface. And, and it's the commerce piece of it also, right? Because mm -hmm. we think we hear natural hair and you're not thinking all the money that you're spending on nope. coconut oil and shea nope. butter. And, nope. Right. <laughs> nope. It's natural. We, we approach natural as it's, you know, it means untouched. Touched, right. You know, you just wake up like this. Unadorned. So <laughs> yeah. And it's not that at all. Um, and I think, you know, that's complicated in the market response to that. But I think it's hair in this way invites us to think about race and blackness in yeah. this instance is made. It's what you do. It's not just, you know, who you are. And so, you know, there's in social media now as of, I guess, maybe seven, eight years ago now, these instances where we see um, white women venture into black hair practices um, that it's not enough to just get your hair braided or put on a wig or get a sew-in, that there are all of these other complicated experiences around feeling and touch and archive that make the black surface. True. Yeah. You're a parent. Mm -hmm. How much of your own processing of your own hair story and doing this research, how much of that has actually impacted the kind of choices that you've made for your children in terms of their hair. Yeah, it's impacted the whole entire experience. <laughs> good. I hope for only the good. I think if there's bad, it's sort of working out my own stuff um, in the process. So um, for folks who've seen my kids, I guess one of the first things they would notice is that I've not cut their hair. Yeah. Um, so they have a lot of hair. Um, which for me was about sort of giving them the opportunity to choose what happens to their bodies, you know. Um, the hard part is that is that I comb their hair and then I have to navigate touch and, you know, hair stories and hair narratives um, in a way that, you know, like everything with parenting, leaves behind, heals the past as parents feel charged to do, you know, so being gentle, um, things like that. The artist Allison Saar gave me this great tidbit from her mother, Betty Saar, the artist, that when she came across tangles and knots and combing their hair, she cut it off as opposed to struggling to, <laughs> <And the pain. laughs> yes, exactly. So how, how do I do this and not inflict pain, physical or emotional, um, I think is sort of the task that came up for me um, in this book and having children. And so I'm in it, been at it. I'm thinking about the woke act, mm -hmm. the attacks on CRT now, mm -hmm. um, really the criminalizing of black studies yeah. and we're probably at a point not too far away where so many different aspects of blackness that are not turned into commodity mm -hmm. yeah. are going to be criminalized. Are, are you still surprised that we are in 2023 still having the kinds of conversations? I'm, I'm thinking about the, the young black wrestler Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. who, who had to cut his hair in order to compete. Discuss tonight over this video now circulating the internet of this moment of humiliation. New Jersey high school wrestler Andrew Johnson having his dreadlocks cut by a trainer before a match. He was forced to have his hair cut by a referee in order to compete or forfeit the match. Yeah. I'm thinking about the, the black girl softball player mm -hmm. here in North Carolina, yes. mm -hmm. right, who had to cut her braids, mm -hmm. right, because they were distracting to the other players. The mid-game decision came after umpires said her hair violated athletic regulations when they couldn't see her jersey number, although the number is clearly visible. This will never change how I feel about my face, my body, my hair, none of it. It's going to be with me for the rest of my life. There's a way in which so much of this anti-blackness besides just simply being anti-blackness, is about accommodating the white gaze. Yes, yes. Right? Are you mm -hmm. surprised that we're still in that moment 
talking about hair, even as it's become this multi-billion dollar industry in which largely white corporations capitalize. are generating, yeah. uh, capitalizing the most in terms of profit. Yeah, it does, it does surprise me um, when I think about it as a consumer, right? That there's this way in which, you know, like many things, we have given so much, you know, to the, to the generation of capital, even in how we spend our money around grooming and care and, and appearing respectable in public. How is this still a problem? Um, but when I take a long view historically, I'm less surprised because in all of those instances, I see it as about controlling the black body and demonstrating power in public, just sheerly for the demonstration of, of power, you know? Um, in the book, I talk a little bit about how locks um, I think confounds the market in a way because it doesn't come under corporate control in the way that natural hair does, yeah. that there hasn't been a sort of movement of product for um, locked hair in the same way as these other kinds of um, hairstyles. But in all those instances you name, what they seem to have in common is that it's the demonstration of power and on children and young people, right? Where they're tasked with making a decision without consulting a parent, right. without some kind of advocate to step in. Um, and in that way, that's pretty much as old as the country, yeah. so, yeah. I, I witnessed early conversations that you had about this book going back five, six years. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and one of your reference points was an Afro sheet commercial. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And I just want to get you to reflect upon the first time you saw that Frederick Douglass Afro Sheen commercial, what your reaction was. I thought it was amazing. I still <laughs> think it is amazing. It is. It sent me. I, I, I'm sure that my clicking of that video helped remove it from YouTube. And now you have to really look very look hard to, to find, find it. it. You know, um, I thought it was amazing. I thought... Um, Bain and all the folks who are involved in the making of those Afro Sheen commercials do something really well, which is to make commercials that aesthetically fit with TV at the time. Yep, you know, there's this kind absolutely. of seamlessness that this feels like good times. This feels absolutely. like all the kinds of shows. Soul Train. Yes, right. exactly. That aesthetically, there's almost no break. And so in that way, the commercial... Um, isn't jarring or disturbing in the way that commercials yeah. are. Um, now, I also thought it was brilliant in the way that in such a short amount of time, they give us an icon of black freedom in the 19th century, <laughs> pieces of black freedom in the 1960s, you know, gesture towards a future of, you know, black people on the move, so to speak. And all so in a all in a minute, you know, I really think it is brilliant. And the series of commercials in, in that campaign are all equally exciting. But that's my favorite. Right. Yeah. yeah. What's next for you, Professor Kyle? What's next for me? I am working on a project on the visual history of Harriet Tubman who is an icon much in the way that Frederick Douglass is and yet complicated in so many ways, um, including her would-be issue on the $20 bill, um, sculptures that go up uh, in her honor and various controversies that arise around them, um, but also the role of photography in her own life. Yeah. Yeah. We've been joined by Professor Jasmine Nicole Cobb, who is Professor of African and African American Studies, and also the Professor of Art, Art History, and Visual Studies here at Duke University. We talked about her brand new book on black hair. Thank you for joining us. Professor Thank you Cobb. for having me. This is great. Black lights and boots burn when I record for watch, and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black, everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back, black.